This is Wild on 7th, your favorite wild podcast. Did you guys see this? This is unbelievable. What is that all about, Kinger? Get in here for the real thing. Like, let's get weird. Maybe I blacked out trying to figure out what was going on. Doubt, worry, fear, because that's what we're breaking the mold on here. Welcome to Wild on 7th, presented by Pilot Games. We're here until it's here. And welcome back to Wild on 7th, your favorite wild podcast. As always, presented by Pilot Games. Make sure you use their products, e-tabs and tablets, while you're out enjoying your libations. Because when you do, your community wins. Why don't you do the the official intro here, Kinger? Oh, All right. Well, he's tan. I don't know where he's his tan lines are. He's been in Arizona. He's a 1985 state champion oh, for geez. Burnsville, although... They played a team wearing Cooperall, so I don't know if that counts. It's like Brett Favre with braces winning the Super Bowl. I don't, I don't know where that factors in. Four to three, he got a Cabbage Patch doll handed to him in his post game interview. Not sure what was going on. We'll get into it. Kevin, Mister Movie Expert, Gambling Expert, Duke Cannon has no place in his life. But if he did yeah. have hair, he would choose Duke Cannon. Gorg. Well, well, that's quite an introduction. No, no applause. No, so, we don't need any applause for that. And. Uh, <laughs> Oh, there it is. Oh, thanks. Hey, there we thanks go. Thanks for being on the ball. <laughs> would you consider your hair a weapon? No, I would not I consider Once my hair anything. Once upon a time, was depressing. it? Yeah, I had a mullet. Uh, 1986, USHL, Des Moines Buccaneers. Should have brought the picture in. Um, <laughs> it's okay. phenomenal. I had the perm in the back. I had, you know, shaved on the sides there. It, I mean, it was so bad. It was good. A lot of what you see at the state tournament for your bit. You had it. I, it was awesome for just a little while, and then it was gone. When did it start going? I think you can, and I'm not throwing my family under the bus here, but I had three daughters just like you, and, and I think you can kind of mark the time, early 90s. I was still, there was something there, but it was starting to go, and I saw my dad, Kenny. I mean, I, I look like him more and more every day, which is, it is what it is. But anyway... Early 90s, mid 90s, and then by the end of the 90s, it was the end of the hair. And I was working with your guy, LaPanta. We were doing high school hockey at that time. KABL 19? All, exactly. And he's always had this luscious lettuce like he has now. In fact, back then, it was like people would touch it to see if it was like a rug. And they look at me and they're like, yeah, yours isn't fake because you got nothing there. And then once we got to the 2000s, it was game set match. So the daughters, okay, so is this like – Young, like teenagers, are picking up your daughters and like honking the horn for them to yeah, come like, here's, out. Yeah, like you're saying stress. Like Trans Am, like, eh, eh, and they don't even come to the door, and then they're running out the door, grabbing their purse, and just a clump of hair fell out every time that <laughs> happened. What, what is the dude, the dad of only daughters? What, how does that fact? Is he? Is Cart's going to lose his hair? That's no, what, that's what I want. Yeah, have this is this like is, I do. Like Cart's. He doesn't have anxiety. But you're, but you're saying that the <laughs> daughters like bring it out in you. Maybe you didn't have anxiety. Oh, no, I've always, I've always run a little hot. That's I, I tough for a goal back, I, I, I got to be fair. I mean, I, I've been a head case for a long, long time. So this is nothing new, and I'm not going to blame my three girls. Like I just overthink everything, and I think that was part of it. And I think you know, it's in the, you know, I'm a horse racing guy. It's in the bloodlines. You know, if you look at my my dad, if you look at my two grandpas, I was always going to have a shiny dome. It was always going to be there. Unless I try to, it's funny because, you know, I've had different companies approach me and, you know, I like to, you know, once in a while be a spokesman like you guys are. And I've had a couple different hair places reach out to me in the last like two, three years. I'm like, listen, I get why you're calling me. You mean like the transplant? That's the thing. Yeah. And I'm like, (laughs) I understand. I don't take this the wrong way, but I'm going to play the cards I'm dealt. And when I'm not working um, my real job, I'll be wearing a ball cap every single day and I'll be okay with it. I don't want... Anything that's not mine. So we move on. God, what, it'd be amazing though if you what had if, like Don Lucia, Colorado College, like curly good hair, curly perm, that just all so all plugs. They gotta harvest it from somewhere too. So what if they like took it from like the back and brought it up to the front of your head? That's an option for that. me. I have hair <laughs> everywhere. Like I'm not kidding. Like it's that's so a, sad. <laughs> like I, and, and again, it's the cards I've been dealt. Right. I mean, you I have it you everywhere get, except the place you want it. Correct. And it's like, come that is on, curse. man. It's curse. sad. That's all right. You're yeah, a, you you're, look, you you're look a stud. Great. You're yeah, tan. Yeah, I sure do. The tan. tan is nice. Uh, hey. Let's let's get rapid fire. Uh, we uh, early edition. The early edition. We're gonna get to know you. Then we're gonna get into the hockey a little okay. bit because we. I, I feel like we know you. Yeah. I'm, I'm sure the audience probably knows you pretty darn well here too. 
but we're going to get a little bit weird, maybe. Oh, no. Um, Goalies have a problem with this, Gorgie. They they take too long on the questions, so to, to you're overthinking it. So it's either answer it or pass. We're going to go back and forth. You ready? Yeah, my significant other has always told me when it comes to the way I speak, and she's always thought at some point I'm going to get fired for this. It's ready, fire, aim. So this might be good think because later. I don't always think speak about what I later. say. I, like I just speak it from the heart, and this could get me in Jimmy some Snugger. real trouble. Can like we edit it. this after? No. no. Nickname. Your host. Gorgie, all my life. First Gorgie. real job? First real job was uh, working at the golf course. My dad was the uh, local pro at the Faribault Golf and Country Club, and from age 12 on, that's where my summers were spent working there. Where? What do you listen to in the car? I listen to a lot of golf podcasts. I turn on whatever fantasy golf podcast I can get a hold of. First concert. Journey and Brian Adams, 1983, at the Met Center in Bloomington, and it was spectacular. Before or after the state tournament? That was before, that was before. my run. Yeah, my run was in 85. Um, it's your birthday. Where are you going to dinner? Oh, wow. Mancini's just down the road. It's my very favorite. Breathtaking. <laughs> Pet peeve. Oh. Pet peeve? People with lots of hair. <laughs> Silence. <laughs> Green light in any <laughs> NHL city. You just get to go get buckled. No question for me. And I'm not going to be getting buckled. I'll probably go to a couple Broadway shows, but it's a no-brainer. It's New York. Mm, wow. Uh, I know you're active on that uh, that X platform, that mm -hmm. Twitter. Uh, I've seen it on your jitterbug. Uh, but <laughs> but what's your favorite social follow? Like, who do you like to follow? Favorite social follow would probably be a guy named Pat Mayo. He, uh, he's out of Toronto. And, again, it's fantasy sports and primarily fantasy golf. When I think of golf podcast in, in the golf world, he's the king, and he's my favorite follow. Do you follow Club Pro Guy? I do. <laughs> he's, good. he's good, too. He's really good, by the way. Yeah, something. Yeah, he's fun. Pre-game meal. Oh, uh, some sort of pasta. I love pasta. Back when I played, it was, it was always spaghetti and meatballs. Not we don't have that now when we broadcast. We we go to the mess hall and, and, and take what we get and it's fine. But if I was picking, spaghetti meatballs would be right up there. So th this might go a little different. Do you have your own Netflix login? Like do you pay the subscription? No. No? I don't use the Netflix unless I'm at home. And Chrissy has all the technology. Oh, so it's hers. Yeah. But she you does it. As an adult, you guys have your own Yeah. Oh, for sure. And then how many people are like on your <laughs> Netflix tree? Well, the three girls have all been over, so they've they've logged on, and I'm they've certain they it use out. it for sure. And her nephew Will, I'm guessing, uh, has tried that, but he's got his folks out in Maple Grove too. But there's probably an extra four. Four. That's not bad. I just like it when pro athletes are making millions of dollars and they're on their mom and dad's Netflix account. That's just. I my do favorite. think that is corny. It happens. Go to drink at the bar. Oh brother, uh, not a big drinker. Uh, I'm going to have to go with the most embarrassing drink I can think of, which is a Malibu and pineapple. Get him, and get him an umbrella. Everybody who's with me so knows you, So that's do you not real. drink? You're I, don't, I don't drink much, and I will, I will preface it by saying don't sleep on a good grasshopper. So 10, 12 years ago, LaPanth and I were up in Warroad at the Patch. We had just got done doing a uh, Warroad uh, Roseau game and went out for a beverage after with all the, the hockey dads. T.J. Oshie's dad happened to be there, rest his soul, great guy. And I ordered a grasshopper, and he lost his mind. Like, he literally got the whole bar together. They brought umbrellas over. They made me, in the, in the middle of the picture, kneel down with these umbrellas and this grasshopper. LaPanta was there, egging him on, of course. And we took this obnoxious picture that TJ still has on his phone. And every time I see TJ, he'll, Gorgie, i got to show you the picture. And there we go. That's amazing. Yeah, it is. It's depressing. What's something you need in the fridge? Oh, man. Grapes. I am obsessed with grapes carts. You know, and they're great. You know how you're watching the game or you're, for me, and watching a show on Netflix, including Full Swing, which I just finished the second season. You don't want a full snack. Like, you don't want the popcorn, but you want something. Yeah. Grapes. Freeze them. I don't know. Ridge, freeze green them. or purple? So purple all the way. Wow, I only go green. I okay. don't think that does it. Um, perfect weekend. What are you doing? Seen at least two movies. At least two. Like, that's to me, that's the essence of a great weekend. In the theater, or are you streaming and stuff? In the theater. Okay. I mean, it, there's just nothing that can replace that experience. Popcorn in the middle? 
Popcorn in the butter middle. Butter in the middle. You gotta layer. You gotta layer the yeah. butter if you do it the right way. Salt in a little canister, maybe put it on later. A little, little salt. Have a couple packets with you, but uh, a perfect weekend for me includes two trips to the theater. Okay, we got to get into this. first car. Oh, it was a terrible. It was a Nova Chevy Nova. Oh, it was so bad. Had a hole in the floorboard. Oh, it was awful. But when you're in high school, you had four wheels and an engine, and it was great. Do you have a hidden talent? No, I, I really don't. Honestly, I I talk about hockey for a living. It's your calligraphy. Well, okay. You do calligraphy? All right. I, I will tell you. Do you make Ukrainian eggs? No, I, I could, though. Okay. Uh, I love a good hard-boiled egg. But um, <laughs> my placards, and I, I live in a different world, right? I mean, we're in 2024. The other people that do my job in the NHL have tablets, and they have all their stuff. I write, to his point, everything down for every broadcast, every hit, every stat. Everything I need is on this giant placard and it's all done in calligraphy so he is right okay we'll give you that that's good so you got the old-fashioned like grandma handwriting oh yeah mm-hmm. for sure beautiful um gift card any store shields is right up there last thing you binged watched either a movie or tv show full swing the uh the latest yep. on netflix about the pga tour i'm current you want any more yeah best piece of advice find something to do in your life for a career uh, that you have passion for. I think I've tried a lot of different things, um, but I will tell you that the pandemic taught me more than anything as I tried to sell cars when sports were shut down to find something you love because it's a whole different world when you're going to work and you're actually excited to do it. Nice, Corey. Uh, last one, guilty pleasure. Guilty pleasure for me, <laughs> not good, but late night eating. I am one of those guys that probably stays up a little too late and uh, probably has a little too many snacks after, like, 10 o'clock, which is so bad for you. Oh, God. I've I got my master's in it. <laughs> yeah, the thing when you late night snack, too, you got to go, you got to get up and get, like, 12 salt and vinegar chips, go back and sit down. Then you got to get up five minutes later, go get a little bit more, <laughs> sit down, get up 10 minutes later, go get some peanut M&Ms. Like you, it's, and you would never go get everything you're going to eat. No. Like here's a <laughs> plate of ice cream. Here's like 25 peanut M&Ms. Here's a bag of salt and vinegar chips and 10 grapes. And like you would just – that would be like Roman disgusting. But if you do it and – if you just peck at it, no damage, right? For me, it's the late-night cereal. Like I'll, oh, I'll be God. watching Dateline because I'm in the obsessed house. with Seriously? Dateline, and it's the late-night – Bowl of cereal. I just, it gets me every time. It's the greatest. I can't have it in the house. It's, it, I used to do it out of cups. Remember, like, the big uh, Metrodome cups? Yes. Because it would almost feel like no one knew you were doing it if right. you put it in the cup, right? It's hidden. Yeah, I feel you. I can't have Doritos in the house. This could be a new pod. <laughs> we could just call it, like, pear-shaped or something and just, just go through all the, all I'm the, in. All the pain. All oh, the there's pain Snacks for after sure. dark. Yeah, there you oh, go. Oh, man, cereal is so good. Mm. You know, that'll get you, though. I just I literally can't have it in the house. So what do, you, what do you eat? Which one? Basic Four is my very favorite. It's a little That's obscure. That's a cereal? Oh, it's so good, dude. Is it's it sugar? Raisins. No, it's got, you know, again, quote, unquote, healthy, but it's not. I mean, you're eating at 11 o'clock at night. And um, Basic Four. Basic Four. It's my very favorite. Check it out the next time you're out there. And I don't like milk at all. Like, milk is not for me, except... On basic four. On basic four, and I get the whole milk, right? The most unhealthy. Oh, yeah, yeah. With the red label, right? Terrible. <laughs> she has the skim ones, and I'm over there. Big guy's got to have his red milk. And uh, that's the thing. Yeah, it's basic four late at night. It gets me every time. 1045. Yep, there it is. Crack the knuckles. The late game's Another. about the second period, right? I'm sweating <laughs> something out, you know, on the West Coast. Who's Calgary playing? Me. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> oh, this week it got real bad because we're in the fantasy hockey championship game. I actually had Congrats. Calgary radio on. Um, listening to some obscure Calgary hockey game at 11 o'clock at night on a Saturday. You talk about a low point in life, but there I was. We've been there, some of us. Uh, carts, but I've movie been. night. Let's talk. Well, for, what's a, what's your all time favorite movie? How do you pick one? Like, if I'm, I'll give you a couple examples of my favorite movies. If it's a romantic comedy, it's Notting Hill, and it's not close. Hugh Grant and Julia Roberts at their peak. For me, though, Vision Quest might be my all-time favorite movie, and I'm not a guy that watches any level of wrestling. That movie is so well done. Madonna's in the movie, who I was obsessed with in the mid-'80s. And then I go back to Hoosiers. 
you know, I look at our state tournament, and again, if you know me, you know how much I love and adore our state tournament. Hoosiers is the story of the Indiana State Basketball Tournament back in the 50s in this little town in Hickory, and Gene Hackman's the head coach, and they go on this improbable run that ends up in the championship game, and it's got a bunch of layers to the story. So I would say Hoosiers or Vision Quest for me. Um, we do need to ask who plays you in the movie. That's on the list of rapid fire. So, like, if there's a bio epic called Gorgi, <laughs> probably, is- probably uh, the guy that played George on on Seinfeld is okay. It? Yeah, 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 nice. Alexander, That's- yeah, Jason Sad. Alexander. Yeah, thank you. Can it's- I? Can I? So the new Roadhouse. Yeah, I just loved it so much. I haven't seen it. So How now is there you're a movie you haven't so seen? you're a movie guy. Was it this in the is literally a movie. It was not in the theater, but this is a new day. You know, it's like cord cutting and all isn't, this stuff. Isn't it? Isn't the preface of this movie UFC fighting? So, so do you you know this? Do you remember when you would go see like Lethal Weapon two? Yeah. And it was just like, it was just good. It didn't matter if it was a little bit cheesy, Tango and Cash over the top. The new Roadhouse is unbelievable. Yeah, Conor McGregor. It's like Cannibal Run. It's like it's like an ensemble cast. The fight scenes are amazing. The mu- soundtrack is amazing. It is world class. Please watch it. I have Amazon to, Prime. I will check it out. Get a bowl it. of what is it? Basic, basic four. four. <laughs> basic four. Some purple grapes right out of the freezer tonight. Tonight's the tonight. night. Yeah, it's a Monday night. I, I would love to. I loved it. I, I just think it was so. It reminded me of being a kid. Okay, I'm gonna check it out on your 80s. Year. It's everything you used to love about the movies. Okay. Have you seen it? No. <laughs> what are you, anti-movies? <laughs> he's, he's anti-Roadhouse remake. Wow. Maybe. He's also, he, he doesn't, he has different problems than us. He's, he's, he's a, you know, he's he, doesn't, he doesn't eat cereal at night. Let's just, oh, I know that. How many movies do you think you've seen in your life? Well, I average two and a half a week. I've done the math. This is in the theater. I'm not talking at home, downloading it for amateurs. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Two and a half a week. I mean, honestly, I, and I, that's what I like to do. Like, legitimately, that's – and I, I figured it out, right? I, I, I'm i a guy that's – I'm if I'm out, I'm on. Whatever I'm doing, I'm on. I'm into it. I'm, I'm bringing energy. Whatever I'm doing. You know this. You guys have both been around me. We all need somewhere to go to just get away for a couple hours. And for me, it's the movie theater. I love the entire process of sitting down, seeing the previews, the lights dim. There's something magical – about that experience. It probably takes me back to my childhood. My dad was obsessed with movies, would take me as I got a little older, and I've kept that kind of thing running. In fact, I, I met my daughter uh, last night to see a movie. Um, what did you see a, last night? Midnight with the Devil. It freaked me out beyond belief. What it was my Midnight second with movie the of devil? the weekend, just for the record. Saw Liam Neeson in Saints and Sinners on Friday. But um, it's, a, it's a story of a 1977 late-night talk show host who's getting beat in the ratings by Johnny Carson like everybody was in the 70s. And he has on on a Halloween night in 1977, he has this set of uh, guests on that are all like mediums, and, and apparently one in particular has adopted a girl that was a part of this horrible fire where there was all these like devil worshipers living, and apparently the devil is living inside this girl, and this, this lady's <laughs> her doctor, and she can bring out the devil. So the, the whole premise of this talk show is they have all these guests leading up to it, and then they're going to have this girl at the end be put into this, this trance, and then they're going to bring the devil out, and it freaked me out. I mean, it was too much. There's no movie you won't watch. You, like- well, I don't see I – don't, I don't love all the special effect movies. Like the, the latest, is it Kong or Godzilla? Those movies do not interest me. I don't like – all the special effects where you've got these creatures. You like stories. I like the stories. I like the drama, the comedy, sports movies. The love. Love the love. <laughs> I'm a lover. So Notting Hill, better than Love Actually? Oh, great. I mean, tough call. I, I Well, you sort of just rushed into it without any question earlier. Notting Hill's at the top for me, but Love Actually is not far behind, and, and neither is Sleepless in Seattle. Um, there are some great ones. Some kind of wonderful. Yes. So... If you, what are you excited about coming out this year? Like this Bike Riders movie looks pretty cool. Looks intense to looks me. Looks like the new Outsider sort of. Yeah, that one looks intense to me. What what what's on your radar? Like a movie that you're legit excited about? Like opening weekend. Boy, there's a movie coming out. I think it's called The Long Drive. It's it's a golf related movie, 
they're hard to pull off. I mean, yeah. Tin Cup comes to mind as one of the greats. Um, golf movies are not easy. Bagger Vance was very good. This one has potential. But it, it's been a couple summers. I mean, a couple years ago, we had been sitting on the latest release of, of Top Gun, and rarely in a situation like that where it's a sequel does it live up to the hype. I will tell you, as a guy that lived through all the, uh, the drama of the first one coming out when it did, that was an incredible summer movie, a sequel that, that lived up to the hype. Tom Cruise, last summer, Mission Impossible came out. They nailed it. It was incredible. I'm super excited for part two of that, which I believe comes out later this year. He's like save the movies. I yes. mean, basically, if you didn't have Tom Cruise, you, you'd have a lot of free time on your hands. We don't want that. Last one on the movies, because I think this is great that you do this. Tell us about movie night. Oh, yeah. Now, I appreciate you. Tell, you know, that's awesome, because we are this week in Wisconsin celebrating our 100th movie. And so this started at the beginning of COVID. I was devastated, honestly, when the movie theaters shut down. And so we have some, some friends that live over in Edina, uh, Tammy and Marty. Mary Cheesick, uh is, is part of this group. And then Chrissy and I, there's five of us that started this movie club. Basically, almost every Sunday, unless there's a conflict, usually three, four times a month, we would get together and we meet on a Sunday night. We take turns bringing takeout food sit down at 6 o'clock, have a meal, and then whoever's pick it was for the movie, which rotates with the five of us, you'd have some game attached to it. And then the people have to guess the movie that you've selected, and then you watch the movie. So this started four years ago, and this week we will have movie number 100. And I'm so excited you teed me up because I got, it just so happened that it landed for me on 100, and I've come up with a March Madness placard with a tournament schedule of Jack Nicholson movies. For some reason, in the first 99 movies, we haven't had Jack Nicholson. I don't know how. So I picked out my eight favorite Jack Nicholson movies, and I've got a game I've built where they're going to play a, like a state tournament, right, where the five of us are going to vote on each matchup, and it's going to build to a crescendo, which will lead to the championship and eventually movie num number 100. So the, you're actually letting them pick what it will be. Yeah. It's, it's, so you haven't, it's going to be one of those eight. One of those eight for sure. You know, and I'm talking classic movies, uh, A Few Good Men, uh, One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest is in the there. The Departed. The Departed is absolutely in there. Um, something's got to give. There's only one of the eight movies on that list that I haven't seen, and it's super old. And, I, and the name's escaping me. I should have brought the placard in. For a little effect today, but I didn't know we we're going yeah, to. We can get road. the photo. It's it's going to be fun though. Looking forward. That's to so it. wholesome. Yeah, yeah. it's great. It's, geez, Isn't it great? Mean, you're like, <laughs> God. He is chicken soup for the. He's court. a true dude. <laughs> that really. but just makes me feel good. That's, I know. It's even but just hearing speaking, these stories, hey, that's like that's the opposite of what I do on the weekend. But, but speaking of feeling good, if it was your night on movie night and you had to bring some good healthy food into movie night, well, what would you? What would you bring? Hey, you know what? Thanks for asking me that question the same way you brought a story out of Gorgie. A lot of people think Memorial Day is the official start of coleslaw season. It's not. It's Easter Sunday. That's when coleslaw season officially begins, oh, especially coleslaw. that hand-cut, fresh ingredient, all-natural Jimmy's coleslaw. They got the regular. They got the pineapple. Uh, throw it next to some baked beans. Throw it on a burger. It's the best. Jimmy's Coleslaw, family-run Minnesota company. Don't you be messing with my dressing. And if you wanted to host one of these at your own house, uh, Kinger? But you'd have to have a good you'd, structure. You, you, yeah. <laughs> I would think. Yeah. Especially you, if it you, rained a lot would, or whatever. You would need the space, and you'd have to have it built out, and you'd want to make sure it's secure. So if you had any construct or like some needs for some construction of a movie theater in your house to be able to host movie night, you could call our friends at Wild Construction. Yeah, absolutely. And if you were at all concerned that maybe some of the movie equipment in your movie room would be damaged because you had a hailstorm and there was maybe uh, some water leaking through, yeah. you could call them too because they can handle that. And heck, winter's over. They can get up on the roof, assess that stuff. Damage does show up up to 12 months later. It's true. Uh, so, hey, and uh, we should note that Wild Construction has leveled up. It's no longer wildconstructionmn.com. It's wildconstruction. Oh, they bought it from a squatter? Com. Yeah. Wow. That's right. So uh, if you uh, were in one of the areas affected by storm damage last year, 
They have all the resources you'd ever need to find out, to get a quote, to have them come over and check it out, wildconstruction.com. That was so good. Should we actually talk about the wild since this is your favorite wild podcast? Have we been avoiding it? Well, he's great. I mean, I want to go to movie night <laughs> with you. I uh, I would watch The Outsiders, Francis Ford Coppola. Um, okay. Was the nail placed into the coffin in the Vegas game? So, well, here's where we're at. Uh, 4.1% chance of making the playoffs. According to, like, the money puck or something? Yep. But St. Louis has 2.2%. And they have more points than us? Yeah. So they factor in strength of schedule. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's a very sophisticated And, and they must be able to track, like, your confidence and state of mind because St. Louis did just lose four rip to San Jose. So that, that was ugly. That, that, that maybe is what, like, if you lose to San Jose, that's what happens to your chances of making the playoffs. So I will say pretty universally when we lost that game with rolling the dice and then uh, the Gopher hockey team lost that It was night, a tough Saturday. There was a lot of, like, well – there's no spring hockey this year. Like, both seasons ended on the same day. I think that happened last it's year, It's all too. done. It was just like, it's done. And uh, I don't know. I still get this weird, like, I still, like, can't accept that it's done. I know, like, the odds are against us. If you had 100 ping pong balls, only four of them get us in the playoffs. But I don't know. I just want somebody to just, like, I want L.A. to, like, lose five in a row. Just make it weird. They're playing Winnipeg next. Let me ask you a hypothetical question based on 4%. And I don't think that, depending on where the Wild finish, and they're not out of the playoffs. 4.1%. Yeah. <laughs> Love they're that. not out of the playoffs yet. There's still a chance, Jim Carrey. Yep. Um, but would you rather have a 4.1% chance at making the playoffs and winning a Stanley Cup or the, or, or the number one pick right now? Well, Macklin Celebrini is something else. Um, well, but it's still only a four percent chance to get them. But I would go with the cup. I mean, I I I, I love the playoffs. So, um, you know, if you were to flip that and say, "Hey, uh, you have a way worse season, and you have a twenty-two percent chance to get Macklin Celebrini," that we're having a different conversation now. But right now, four and four, give me the chip in the chair. Give me a West Seventh night. Give me some playoff hockey, man. But yeah, I don't. He's really good, though. How about um, you, Gorg? I want a chance the playoffs. I mean, I it's my favorite thing that we do. Like, I mean, outside of Hockey Day in Minnesota, playoff hockey is so intense. To be a part of the broadcast, to be ringside for those games, I mean, it, it's – I'll be honest, it's, it's devastating when we don't get in mm -hmm. for all of us. We love it so much, and I feel for the guys. Like, I love this team. I love the, the, the personalities they have. I love how much they care. I love the passion they play with. And I feel like this year um, they just never were given a real chance to do it. Like, I mean, I think the effort has been there day in and day out. And the desire and effort have. I mean, I, I really respect these guys for the way they go about their business. And I love the guts. If you look at the core of this hockey team, start with Kirill up front, Hartman, um, Middleton, Felino. I mean, these guys have guts, man. Eck. Like, I love the core of this hockey team. And I think for this year, I, I, I'm i like you. I get down this time of year when you look at the numbers and you see that it's probably not going to happen. But then I get excited because I look at where this thing is going. And if they're healthy next year, they're not only a playoff team, but they're a team that can do some damage when they get there. And my two biggest questions into this year were Rossi and Faber. I have no question anymore. I mean, Faber might be potentially the best defenseman that's ever played in this organization. He's not there yet. But that's, that's a legitimate thing. And Rossi, I didn't see this coming. I'll be the first to admit, I did not see him scoring 20 to 25 goals this year. He's a legitimate top six forward in this league. And so that part excites me, guys, about where it's going. It's just right now, it's, it's tough. Well, I love the optimism. That's what we're supposed to be doing here. I, I, uh, so the, let's talk about some of this stuff. Um, I don't know, the, the pulling the goalie thing, it uh, – you're upset about it, I can tell. Yeah, you know, and part of the reason is because in Minnesota we just lose all the time. I know you won the state <laughs> championship in 85. Like, but I've lived here I, all my life. But, like, you have that. Like, you you won that. So you, you're, you like, kind of, like, fine. Nothing bad can really happen to you. You had that moment. There's just something about when it's that hard to even get one point, and you might have got two, you know, yeah. if you win the shootout. I don't know. And then, you know, we're – we got 80 – what do we got? 79 points. L.A. has 87. Could have 81. 
I don't know, man. I just uh, I know that we did it before, and it was so cowboy and so cool. But like, there's just a side of me that's like, you're playing Vegas, man. It's like trying to steal, like Tony Soprano's wallet. Like, if you can get one, you know, live to fight another day. You got Ottawa on Tuesday. I don't know. I just. I guess the, I think what he's going to do now, though, is he's just doing it the rest of the year, right? So it's one think. of these things like he's never going to punt I again. Against Ottawa, I don't you think do it. so. Yeah, I, I don't know. I, I, I don't know what the percentage would be. Let's just assume, which is hard to assume, but let's just say to play devil's advocate, they got the two points and they were sitting six behind L.A. We said 4.1. What is that number now? 12, maybe. I don't that know. high? I don't know. I think you have a lot oh. better chance with nine games left, right? You're six points down, nine games. Okay, let's let's just play that. You could try to compare it and look out east and what some of those teams that are six points back. It, I think it goes up to like. A well, let's say you go. I'm six gonna and check. Two. You carry on the conversation. Well, let's just say you go, okay. Go nine here. games left. Is that right? Yeah. Let's say you go seven and two, and you're six. Let's say That's we fourteen points. Okay, so we get fourteen points. And LA did, would have to go they four would and five. Points. Yeah. That's doable. Yeah. So uh, it, when it comes to the, the pulling the goaltender in OT, there, I, I think. If the coach's thoughts were, or if everybody's thought was, all right, we're, we're not chasing down Vegas anymore. We're chasing down L.A. You almost have to pick your target when you're making these choices. Because if, you, if you're chasing down Vegas, I think you pull the goaltender in regulation. So when, when you pull the goaltender in OT, four on three is much more dangerous than six on five. Absolutely it is. And you have a higher probability of scoring four on three than you do six on five. Um, I think there's there's no doubt in my mind that that's the case. But the reward is the same. It's two points. The risk changes. Like, you can't take the point away from Vegas, but you lose your point, right? So it either way, if you lose that game, pulled goalie in regulation, pulled goalie in overtime, you get zero points. If you win that game in regulation, you get two points, Vegas gets zero. If you win it in overtime, you get two points, Vegas gets one. You're making ground, but very little ground. It's, right. it's one point. Now, if So you'd rather see him pull it in regulation, yeah. even though you understand that yeah, the four on three is better. Right. It's it just if, if Vegas is the team that you're chasing down, don't concede a point to them. Like you, you know, you've got to take it in regulation and just put it out there. I actually think it's probably harder to score a goal – five on six than it is for a sh- like the shorthanded team than it is three on four. Yeah, There's four. so much ice out there. They yeah. just have to win a race to a loose puck or a bounce to the middle. There's not enough bodies to cover all the open ice. So an empty netter is probably easier to score three versus four than it is five versus six. There's just so many and more And they were bodies. probably ready for it, right? The surprise factor that you certainly had in that game against Nashville Vegas Vegas is gone. Yeah, or in Vegas, yeah, Vegas is ready. Like they know that might be coming. And, you know, the problem is you got multiple teams you're trying to hunt down and Maybe going into that game, you yeah. thought it was Vegas. Now it's clearly L.A. as you sit here. Um, knowing this group, you know, they've got a huge week ahead. They've got four games this week. You've got three of the four at home. The road game is in Chicago. Win all four this week, and, and maybe you give yourself a chance. It's just such an uphill yeah. battle. You know, you know what else played out on Saturday that we should discuss? We've all played – if you've played fantasy football, you know what it's like when you have to set your lineup on Sunday morning and you don't know if your Monday night tight end is going to play or yeah. not. So you have to set your lineup and you're just rolling the dice. The Wild had their game Saturday afternoon, and L.A. played Calgary Saturday night. That's the game I was listening to. Yeah. So yeah. Calgary ends up beating L.A. You don't you don't know. You have no idea. But you kind of assume L.A. is the better club. They're probably going to take at least a point. You don't really know. So you've got to play your hand before theirs is even dealt. And that's kind of yeah. – I, I think that maybe changes the decision a little bit. If you know L.A. loses that game, you're like, okay. You probably don't pull them. Now, no. now Vegas is past L.A. L.A.'s nearest to us. Maybe we don't pull them. We just roll the dice, concede the point to Vegas in overtime – and try to win the extra three on three or in the shootout. Trust our goaltenders. Trust our playmakers. And it's, Gus was awesome that day. Yeah, he was awesome. You know, right. and then it it it's a, it was unfortunate circumstance. Yeah, I, I like the fortitude. I like that they're going for it. I like the message that was sent. I like all of that. I think there's just circumstances against them that really just didn't play out well. Devils ten percent chance. They're six games back. So I mean, I, six points. Six yeah. points back. You you, yeah. you get I guess you're two and a half you know, times times better than you have now, but. Um, 
So let's talk about the guy. So the, the reason, part of the reason I love playoff hockey is none of the other stuff matters, right? So if you watch a playoff series and you decide who performed, it's worth like 10x, right? If you have, if you're really good in the playoffs, even if you look at like if, if Johansson went on a run in the playoffs and scored five goals and the helped us win season. a series, no one really is going to remember right. the 82 games. But I've been watching this stretch, and I want to hear, Karts, your take on this too. I mean, we kind of talked about this earlier. You're really just getting points from one line. I mean, Kaprizov's been on this just – he is just a man-child. Uh, Eck, now that he's been back, has been great. Boldy kind of like pops in – He's like a classic winger. Like he might disappear for a couple games, but then he'll pop back in, and he's obviously gotten better. Um, I think Faber's been a, a tour de force this year. But, you are I mean, you're talking about a small group of guys that you core. consistently talk about. It's almost like our serial, the core four, right? We got we got <laughs> Brock, Kirill, Eck, Eck. and, and I, I don't know, like Flurry this year. Probably is in yeah. that, that four, but that like fourth that's spot is rotated enough. in and out between Zuccarello, Boldy, Boldy yeah. Hartman. Yep, you could. You but know. that's not enough dudes, right? No. Twenty-three no. guys, yeah. and you got four guys you yeah. talk about. Like, I mean, that is. I mean, that's a long ways away from you know Duhame scoring ten goals or, you know, some of these like, like I, that's why we beat the bad teams and we. And we lose to the good ones. I mean, because you, you know, it matters. It right? just, I, I just don't know. You know, of course, Kirill might get a hat trick every time we play Ottawa, San Jose, Chicago, but when we go up against Nashville, Colorado, Vegas, you know, we get one goal. That's why the thing really bugged me out about the goalie yeah. pull is like, God, you could maybe beat Las Vegas or whatever. Like, like with one goal, you can get points against Vegas. Like, how do we flush that? Like, that's crazy, you know? I don't know. But, it, but you think the depth is there, Gorgie? No, I think that this year, especially with the injuries this team has yeah, yeah. gone through, there just hasn't been that depth of scoring. The reason they were able to eclipse 100 points the last couple of seasons prior to this one is they were getting depth scoring. You were seeing guys on the bottom six produce. That hasn't been the case this year for whatever the reason. And it, it's a different Not at six. all. Like, never. It's been tough, like, and I, I think that's the biggest area. And I think if you look at what the Wild are dealing with, with the contracts they're paying out to Suter and Parisi, um, that's a big part of it, right? Yeah, because I mean, that $15 million could supply the type of depth where you have a good, dangerous player on the third or fourth line. Right now, we don't have that. Our top six is pretty good. Our, our defensive core, when they're healthy, especially when you look at where this thing is going next year, it's really good. We've got two goaltenders, but the depth scoring, I think, has really been a factor. I did go on a rabbit hole and watch this. Uh, is it Riley Height? Yeah. yeah. I watched his. He broke a record for the W or the O, maybe, and uh, they made a I think it was his team's record. tribute video for him. Um, his team's record for points or something. I mean, that's pretty he, good. He seems to be pretty exciting. I, I do hope some of these prospects come in here and turn into – a Rossi or a Faber, you know, I know that's asking too much, but like you're very optimistic about next year. I am. You're like, oh, we well, get I mean, healthy. I, this team's so good, we're going to be fine. What makes you say that? We because be we got no, but we have no margin for error. When we started this season, you know, when we talk, it was like we're going to be fine unless we get hurt. We got no depth, and we got one hand tied behind our own back with the the deals, the cap. Still for another year. One more year. So what makes you happy? What makes you optimistic for next year? Well, I'll start on the back end. So I don't know if Flower is going to come back for another year or not. I I he certainly should. feel like he will. He because should. Because he's had a great year. Bottom line is we have three goalies back there where we're going to find two rock-solid options, whether it's Wallstead and Gus, Wallstead and Flurry, Whatever combination you want to pick, I'm cool. Now you're healthy on the blue line. So now you're looking at a top four that includes – Faber, Middleton, Spurgeon, and Brodeen. That's a hell of a top four, but we're not done. I love Zach Bogosian. I can't believe what he has brought to this hockey team. And you're going to tell me he's on the third set with a Merrill or a Declan Chisholm? And Declan's been good, too. He's been really good. Great pickup off waivers from Winnipeg. Awesome. So there's the back end of this hockey team. It's rock solid. We know what we have in the top line. We've talked about it. They're great. We need to find some other supplemental scoring. You mentioned some of the prospects, but let's just get to a healthy 
roster, where Marcus Foligno is one of those bottom six. This guy can score 15, 20 goals if he's healthy in a season. That makes a, a difference to me. And then you look at some of the players you mentioned, young guys that are up and coming. We don't know what we have with who's Nadinov, but he's going to be a bottom six guy. I think we can see that, that can win faceoffs, can make plays, will get better. He's 21 years old. I mean, this thing is only going one way. The core of this hockey team that I mentioned, Kaprizov still in his mid-20s. X still with upside. But then you get to the real good stuff. Boldy, 21, 22 years old. Same thing with Faber. Declan Chisholm. I mean, they, they are a young team. The goaltending outside of Flower, those two guys, young, with upside. I'm excited about where this thing is going. They are 100% a playoff team next year if they don't have the type of injuries they had this year, yeah. which is ridiculous. It's, it's injuries. For sure. It's injuries, and it was a, a different style. It was the coaching change, and it was like it, just running in sand. You know, like you, you feel like you're getting somewhere. You look back, and it, you just – like they weren't able to gain ground this year because of all of those like unforeseeable things. You're right. You go into the season this year, and it was number one thing. This roster looks good, balanced, yeah. nice. But it's – You cannot get hurt. Yeah, you cannot you, have injuries. You get cut into bone and muscle – with one guy going down. I mean, it's there's no fat. And, I mean, you said it at the start of the season. You're like, hey, as long as we stay healthy, you know, and it was the complete opposite. And then not only were there injuries, it was the injuries to the guys that you can't have injured. It's it's Brodeen, X, Spurgeon, you know, and, and – Key guys at the wrong time. I look at when this team was in the top eight, we were in Winnipeg. And it was maybe just past the midway point of the season. While they've been climbing, they, you know, they had made the coaching change. They had kind of found their groove. They finally had reached the top eight for like 24 hours. And in that game, Kaprizov and Gustafson go down. They go one seven and one in their next nine. And frankly, they never recovered. It, it wasn't just that one sequence because you mentioned the amount of injuries they had starting with Spurgeon before the season even started. That was in the preseason. And it just there was a domino effect. The one thing when you have the Suter and Parisi clip right now with the contracts that you cannot afford are two or three key guys to go down, and that's exactly what happened this year. And so I think that we we have to look at it from this perspective too. Those it, it's not a coincidence that those guys were the ones getting hurt at the worst time. It's because you also, out of necessity, yep. had to lean on those guys at those times, right? So like, they might be tired. No player's going to go and say, I'm tired. No one's going to say, take a couple minutes off my plate today. They're going to say more, 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 more. <laughs> right? Yeah. But that's a coach's job to manage that stuff. Like you see drop off, you see fatigue. And with the wild starting off kind of slow, no Spurgeon behind the eight ball, coach getting let go, they had to be all in from like game six on. So there was no management of workload, of bumps and bruises. It was, are you good? Yeah, I'm Let's good. Go. Let's go. And you factor in. And you use them to the fullest of their ability, if not 10% beyond that. This is my 18th year doing the job, and I will tell you guys both, um, this year has felt like two years. Oh, yeah. It's been – and I'm and I'm holding a microphone interviewing the guys. I'm not out there playing. I'm not out there practicing. To Cart's point, this season has felt remarkably long. We went to Sweden in November yeah, – yeah. It feels like three years ago. There have been extra things aside from the injuries. Talk about the coaching situation, the pressure early, getting behind the eight ball, pushing, pushing, pushing. I mean, I remember a conversation I had with Spurgeon and Brodeen right after the Sweden trip, and we were talking about the schedule that lied ahead. And they're like, it already feels like a full season. And they were just being honest. Like, we were just around the rink just talking. And it's like, I get it because I've lived it and I've seen it. These guys have been in a position of desperation for months. And so I don't know what effect that loss will have against Vegas over the weekend on them. Um, it, it felt – I'm with King, or I'm an emotional guy. It felt like the air was let out of the balloon. 4% seems high to me as I look at this pragmatically. But these guys, to me, I've been around them for a long time, the core of this hockey team. They just don't look – I mean, Drew Erickson X never going to quit. Like, this guy does not know how to play the game unless he's playing with his hair on fire 100%, everything he's got. Mm-hmm. Kaprizov's the same way. Like, there's no off button with these guys. So I, I have hope they're going to give it their best shot, and I, I love where this thing is going. It just might not be this year, sadly. With injuries, too, and I've been touching on this a little bit 
with the the great play that Kaprizov has had. There, there was we heard rumblings that he, he there was something maybe nagging him early in the year and the production wasn't there and he wasn't scoring at his normal clip. But all of a sudden he looks healthy now, like he looks like really healthy. Yeah, and and his play has been through the roof, right? Oh. So it's almost like keep these guys healthy, and that's it's easier said than done, especially when you're trying to make the playoffs and um, and different things. But yeah, it, it it comes down to that. But there are some silver linings to the injuries and to the situations that the Wild had to be in this year. Declan Chisholm would be one. Brock Faber would be another. If Jared Spurgeon's here, Brock Faber is not playing twenty five oh five on night. Mm. He's not. No way. No, he's not. Um, if Eck isn't hurt, we don't see Rossi in must-win games down the stretch against St. Louis and on the road. Can you score? We need you to. He he shows up and scores a couple goals. You know he slides in there with some with Kaprizov. They figured some things out with some of these younger players. You know, and I think I touched on Declan Chisholm too. Like, they had to go get him. They needed offense. Let's take a chance on this kid, and he looks like he's going to be good. He could be a top four D man. So there, there are some unintended consequences, which actually are unintended benefits to the unfortunate situations that the Wild faces here when it comes to injuries because now I think you see what you've got. And over the last week, I've been saying it to anybody that can listen, what I think I am most excited about now from watching this stretch of hockey is it felt like it felt like a playoff series in that you needed to win every single game. You you couldn't have a bad one, which that's playoff hockey. Like you you have to bring your best and consistently. And it's different opponents. It's travel. It's different nights. It's getting yourself ready. And the young guys were able to do it. And they were the guys that you could actually count on to be good. Now, you didn't know you could count on them going into this stretch. But after coming out of it, you see, yes, those guys are it. Like Brock Faber has that that – uh, that like that winner's mentality. So I, I think there are good players and there are great players. A big difference to me is if they have that that winner's gene, the DNA to win the games on the line. Are they different somehow? Like, are they better when it matters the most? And Brock Faber actually seems to be like that. Uh, Kirill is. And I think there's no doubt in my mind or anybody's mind. But now I think we started to see a little bit of that from Faber. And um, that's exciting. Now, Rossi, to a lesser extent, but maybe it's there. There's there's hope with that, I think, right now and some excitement around it. But um, I, I don't know. I, it's exciting some of the stuff that I saw down the stretch when they had to win these games, how good these players could be. Well, it's like, I mean, Faber will wear a letter at some point, whether it's here or somewhere else. Hopefully it's here for a long time. But if, if Vegas had a line, a futures bet, will so-and-so win a Stanley Cup, right? You start looking at if Kaprizov's on that board, if X on that board, if Faber's on that board, I'm taking that bet all day. And I'm carrying it around in my wallet. It might be for three, five, seven years, but I expect to get paid. Now, there's a lot of other guys where – I just don't know. It doesn't mean you don't like them or they're not good personalities or whatever, but there, there's something about that. And Flurry has it too, like that they're just – Yeah, just Flurry a, has it. There's a winning mentality where you're like, that guy, like you, when the spotlight's on him – Rubber meets the road. And, and, and he should want to freak out. He's actually going to lean into it because – and it, sometimes it's an experience like Faber had in the national championship game, right? He, he was devastated. I think it took him a month to, like, feel normal. Now, he, he doesn't want that again. So when he gets close enough to grab something, he's going to try to grab it. Whether he gets it or not, he's not going to be on his, back, on his heels. I think the, the Marc-Andre Fleury uh, experience – I mean, I look at that move when it happened – how he's played, but more importantly, how he's carried himself. Has to help. There, there is a, a butterfly effect in that room. Like, there is an effect. I, anyone who's played the game understands what that means. When you're in the locker room with somebody like that that does lean into those high-pressure situations, there is just something about this guy. When I interview other guys, whether it's on camera or we're just talking at the rink, the twinkle they get in their eye, having him as a teammate – to me, is something that we're going to see payback this organization for years and years to come. 
He might not be here when this team finally breaks through, but I can promise you when you talk to these guys, if and when they get it done, they will tell you he had a big part in it because of the way he carries himself every single day at near age 40, the way he practices, the way he competes, the way he wants to be on the ice in those big spots has an effect on a Rossi, has an effect on a Faber, a Declan Chisholm. All these young guys that are wide-eyed knowing that they're friends with Marc-Andre Fleury and he's their teammate. I think it's incredible. Yeah. You know what else is kind of exciting about Fleury? Uh, is that winners win. <laughs> you know, they you put them in any situation, they just, like, find a way to win. And reading the tea leaves of his quotes recently, the family's happy, his wife likes it here, the kids are, um, you know, in school, they're enjoying it. He's going to be done playing. It happens to all of us. We're done. He still has like. N- but what if he sticks around here? He still what has. What if this abs. is the place he sticks around? Because there's going to be a bidding war for his services post playing days. For sure. And the Wild might have one foot in the door right now. And if he if he has a front office job, winners win. Now you got Billy with four cups. You've got Flurry. Like all of a sudden, it's like well, he's man. not done playing. He's I, not done playing. But, but it's going to happen is, someday for sure. I, I mean, if you watch him this year, I would argue he's been better in a wild sweater this year than at any other point in his time in Minnesota. He's oh, been for sure. fantastic this year. He's much calmer in that. Mm-hmm. He's just been – I just got to say, the goalie here, Gorg, calling out Flurry with the butterfly effect on oh, the team. I mean, like, even though he's not a butterfly the, goal team. I mean, but that's a, that is <laughs> that was an extraordinary um, <laughs> guest turn for you, oh, brother. Gorgie, I have to say. I, uh, I do want to give Middleton some credit, too, because – you know, he he's like uh remember on chips it was like Ponch and John. Like he's with Faber all the time doing this too. And like you're not sitting there covering your eyes being like Middleton. You know, I mean he's been thrown into this new role where um, Well he was out I mean he's number one D man alongside Spurgeon too. So he's kind of But he's done great. Yeah, I mean, he's, he's held that spot. The puck into the net. Brodeen's put the puck into the net more. We've actually gotten a little more scoring from the the back end when we haven't had depth um, from the forwards. But, but yeah, I, I like the theory that the back end's in good shape. I just – I wish there was some prospect I could see that's going to come in and, and make a, you know, a, a Rossi type when did, difference. When did Middleton sign his, his new deal? Was it, is this his first year on it or second? I think it's his first. So – there's something to be said about that too. You have a guy that has to grind until he's 24ish, 5ish before he gets his chance in the NHL and then he makes it and you have to protect your opportunity by playing safe a little bit. And then he finally gets his 3-year deal. Like, hey, they like me. They tell me I'm playing top line alongside Jared Spurgeon. I I'm going to see if I can play. I think we've seen a little bit of that from Middleton. Sure we have. Like, I I am going to jump up. And in up this it. system it allows yeah. that freedom. I'm going to jump up. And he can do it. And we talk a lot about Faber, but, you know, maybe Brock Faber doesn't develop the way he did this year without having a guy like Middleton by his side, who, by the way, is pretty easy to play with. Guy's going to go out there and bust his butt. He's going to block shots. He'll protect the front of the net. and He'll allow you to do whatever you want. Like, he's a pretty easy guy to play with. Who doesn't want to play with Jake Middleton? I mean, he's an awesome guy. You know what he's sneaky good at that I think, to Kinger's point, that nobody's given him credit for? Is he actually pulls people to him? So like good good hockey players pull people to them. They're not reading the play, trying to figure out what's open. They're reading who's coming at them and waiting until they're in the right spot to make their play. So they're like a half a step of everybody else. Middleton kind of has that. He he wants that D to D pass. He's he's gonna take ice. He's gonna bring somebody to him. Then he's gonna move it. He's not gonna be like Makar and walk the blue line two and ten and dangle up there, but he still brings people to him, which which matters. And then he also understands once this guy gets to me, if I make my play and he's on the wrong side, I'm gonna continue to go because he's in a bad spot. And then that's where I think he's he's produced some of his offense. Uh, but yeah, he he fits into the system that Hines has brought really well. Yeah, and and again, aside from what we see on the ice every single game practice here. How about the personality? I mean, that that matters to me too. Like, oh, nobody it's a grind, I mean, right? It's an 82 game grind, and I just think this team, the way it's constructed right now, to have the personality it has off the ice allows them to get through seasons like this, which have been really, really hard on everybody. But Jake Middleton's never had a bad day in his life. I mean, look at him in that locker room every single day. Like this guy is fun to be around. It's infectious 
to have that type of personality around your young hockey players. And I just love that the core of this team um, isn't just about going out there and playing hockey. They are really all about bringing it every single day, the personality, the fun, the flavor. And, yeah, when they get on the ice, that tends to carry over. I love what I'm seeing, and I, like, I've been around this a long time. This group is going to do something special. I have no doubt in my mind that the, the core of this team, to your point, with those tickets in your pocket, is going to eventually get it done. And I think it sucks this year that we've had to go through the grind that we have, and I think it's really hard on these guys to lose Dean Evison, to fight the fight they fought for Hines and come up short like they're likely going to. But some of this scar tissue will pay off when it gets good. And it's cumulative from last year. Remember we lost those like yeah. first five games at the start of last season, so we – even though they made the playoffs, it was just exhausting. They have not gone on a long playoff run by any means, but they almost have the wear and tear yeah. emotionally of like a Tampa where it's like, God, they've just been fighting, so it kinda, for it, fighting for it for like two years. It kind of feels like you're at the slot machine and you're just getting beat up. You open your wallet, you got no money left, but you're like, I, I'm invested in this machine so right close. now. I can't yeah, walk I can't away leave. from it. Somebody hey, else is going to Hey, win hun, can it. you go to the ATM, get me a couple honeybees <laughs> so I can slap them in here? Because we are going to win on this slot machine. Oh, God. That's actually probably a decent analogy. That's, that's bad. I think that's true. So uh, another silver lining, uh, the podcast slogan, we're here till it's here. So th there's, a, there's a high probability. 90 something percent chance that the podcast is back next. That's year. right. Yeah. We're going to walk off when they win a Stanley Cup. So, with that, we should probably preserve um, relationships with sponsors and everything else. So, we appreciate all of the sponsors and making this podcast possible. So, let's check in with them. Wild on Seventh has a brand new sponsor. We couldn't be more excited about them. Cub. If you're looking for some fresh, delicious milk, you're going to want to check out Cub. 48 hours from farm to shelf. You're not going to find that anywhere else. You're going to pay less. So head on into your favorite neighborhood grocery store, Cub, and get yourself some delicious milk. Lean into it and end up with a Jake Middleton-sized milk mustache. Thank you for being here, Cub. Hey there, it's Ryan Carter from my friends at Aquarius Home Services. You know, they say knowledge is power, but sometimes it's who you know that really matters. And I'm grateful to know the team at Aquarius. Why? Well, because my home functions seamlessly with their help. They handle everything from electrical and plumbing issues to furnace repairs and installing new water heaters. Whether it's fixing the flickering lights or ensuring my furnace is running smoothly, Aquarius always has me covered for all my home needs. Aquarius believes in earning the right to be recommended. They're just a click away at AquariusHomeServices.com. Oh, hey there. Get in here. Hey, get in here. Hey, get in here. Get in here! All right, guys. Hey, again, thank you to the sponsors. Uh, we love you guys. Gorgie, thank you for joining us. Uh, we've got a little bit more time with you, and I want to get into a couple of things. Um, real quick to each one of you guys, who do you think is the biggest rat in the NHL right now? Oh, it's the dude on Florida. Kachuk. No. Oh, you're talking Cousins? Cousins. You're, you're talking, oh. Kachuk. Kachuk's you think it's too Kachuk? good to be a rat. I think, it, I think it's Jack Eichel. I oh, think it's Jack with Eichel. With the spear? It's, uh, it was like a couple. arguing the call? It was a couple years ago where I, I, I felt bad because I was critical of this guy. I was like, I don't know if they can win with if Vegas can win with a guy like Jack Eichel. And sure enough, they did. They won last I year. I was shocked. And I'm like, I well, let's go into this. This is good. Let's go. Okay, so you're you're referring to Kirill gets him on a clean hit earlier. Well, just, so I'm watching the so game. Let's I'm give, watching the give game me in the, general. Something I don't think everybody saw it the way you saw it. Like I, I saw the I mean, I mean, they missed it, not that they wouldn't agree with you. So I saw the spear, and I was like, whoa, that's like 75th anniversary NHL Darian Hatcher hockey. Like, they, <laughs> he tried to spear him. He did. Like, that's amazing. That's interesting. <laughs> like, I was at a bar watching it. But what, what happened before that that makes you think it's even dirtier? Well, again, what I, what I love about it is that it's Kirill. So it's star on star. It's... It's let's meet at center ice. I think Kirill gets a piece of him and like an open ice hit, and Eichel doesn't like it. So moments later, he like 
wades around for his chance, and then Krill's coming up the ice, and it was malicious. It was shish kebab. Yeah, it was dirty. It was ratty, and just tries to spear Kirill. I think they got the call right, and I actually think it's probably advantageous for Eichel that he got five in the boot from from the match. Otherwise, it maybe would have been fine suspension. Well, it would have been a much different finish to that game for sure you know there might have been some paybacks there would have been there would have been and there still might be nah, nah, we play him again. they might want a healthy eichel in vegas might happen again and uh, Kirill came he, he comes back he scores three minutes into that power play so um that was kind of divine justice a little bit there too and I, but i don't know if that's going to be enough to settle it no. but but eichel kind of he kind of walks that line a little bit and he he plays the like the kind of like I'm the victim card a little bit, but but then you know he he he's kind of sneaky little. Yeah, spear. he's got the. That's what he's doing. He's got the Peyton Manning neck. Um, Kachuk got him in the playoffs, remember? Right yeah. at the blue line, and oh, then yeah. he then he went like running to the penalty box like an injured dog. To your point, but then he came back and yeah, yeah that was he's, weird a, he's an right. American player though, so like I got to kind of get my mind right around him as we go he, on the decade he, of dominance with Billy Guerin for USA dominating hockey for the next couple of years. But, yeah, I don't know. You might be right. He maybe needs a lean radish. into being more of a rat. Yeah, Radish. It's not consistent. Maybe he's not a rat. He's a radish. A, he's radish. A little spicy. When you're that good, it's hard to be a rat. Like I, I will not call Matthew Kachuk. Well, what about Brad Marchand? Too good. No, they're too good. 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 They're too good. A, a what about rat? Jason? He's a rat. I think Marchand. A rat is like rat. cousins. Um like a true rat is like Dylan Cousins is just a perfect rat, I think. Like Sean Avery is a true yeah, rat. True rat. Not that they weren't good players, but yeah. like Matthew Kachuk's like a hundred point guy. He Tom can't Wilson? be a rat. He can't. Rat, he's not a rat. Wilson's a heavyweight. He, he's too. He's too. He'll fight. So I think you can be a rat, rat and a good player. I think that that's totally there. I don't think you can be a rat and a if, fighter if you fight. Okay. That makes sense. Stir it up and let somebody else fight your battle. Well, like, that's a rat. That's a rat. Like Hartman could really lean into his ratness if he wanted to. But he fights. I know, but he 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 has. Oh, he has the tendency. He has the. Like, he just needs a green light. I think he needs the green light. Of, it's one of the greatest. I love it. I love it as a hockey fan. Like, like it's so. This is when you know you're kind of bad as a hockey fan. Like I was watching the BC game against Michigan Tech. I think Michigan Tech, and they're totally out of it. And you can just see the Michigan Michigan Tech guys be like. So we're not winning. I really hate that guy. And and then you would just see like at at the blue line yes. like headshot. And and even when I'm watching, I'm like respect. Like I know that's a horrible thing to say, but like Hartman, the beauty of Hartman is when you're watching it, like Heinz must just be like Ryan. I know how you feel right now, but I really need you to try to control yourself. Like he's the. I love having guys like that that react they're emotional they're not robotic they they can you know get their wires crossed like you said um yeah he's he's a fun one but i think he's legitimately hated like i think if you were to ask oh, other sure. fan bases like ryan hartman is hated by like 10 teams in this league for sure i think mm -hmm. which makes me like him more and, and fans too because he does he will get on like the on like twitter yeah. and like rap, like quote tweet something or something that's uh, great he has that it factor that upsets everybody around him. I think he ran the goalie in that game. I think yeah. he ran over Logan Thompson. He, he's yeah, he did. never met a goalie he didn't want that's, to run By over. the way, that's bogus. He that got pushed. That, yeah. But that goal is to bogus. So, there, there's nothing he can do to try to get out of the way of the Wait. goaltender. And he got shoved at the last second by Petrangelo. But because it's Ryan Hartman, because he has the reputation with everybody, including the stripes, he got called. It was a terrible call. I thought, and again, I'm not a Mr. Official guy. You've been around me. I think you know this about me. I'm not blaming the official. I thought the officiating over the weekend was quite poor. I did not care for the calls in that hockey game. I, I, at one point, I'm watching in a bar just like you, and I'm like, well, Malibu minute, Crosby in hand for sure. Grasshopper. It, well, no, no, gra that's all the that celebratory drink. Um, I had nothing to celebrate after that pull goalie episode, but. At some point, midway through the hockey game, we got guys laying all over the ice, and it's three power plays for Vegas and none for Minnesota. I'm like, what is going on here? Then you do the five-minute call. Okay, good. You got the call right. You reviewed it fine. And then nothing. Like, nothing. I, I just – it was quite poor. I didn't care for it, but whatever. 
Hey, we got to do a little golf and a little gambling too well, mixed in. Yeah, I also want to do the the NCAA. So, uh, Greg, you watch the NCAA hockey? I watched here and there. Like, I I was really cheering for Michigan State outside of Minnesota because they had been bad for a while, and this year they had this unbelievable year. They won the championship, took down Michigan in that championship game a week ago, and I just felt like, ah, oh, you can see where this is going. And I sure mainlined enough, it, Carts. I watched every single second. So if you I need, watched if the you need a little college hockey, I can help you. Yeah, uh, it's – go ahead, let it rip. I, I'm just it, – it's fun. Like, it, it's the state of hockey. It's coming back to the cities. It'll be here on the weekend. Um, yeah, so you got, uh, you got a really nice field that came through. So Boston College, uh, class of 96, what's up? Um, phenomenal. Um, young though, kind of the team that usually loses in like a semifinal. I thought they were going to lose to Quinnipiac, um, which was giving me PTSD from the Gophers last year, but um, just crazy talent. Cutter Gauthier, Will Smith, um, they're absolutely stacked. So you got BC is going to play Michigan. Michigan's also loaded and is playing the best hockey of their whole season. They came into Mariucci a couple weeks ago. I think it's the I've never seen a team dominate the Gophers in my whole life than than they did. They got this uh, Seamus Casey on the back end, Rucker McGrory, uh, Gavin Brindley. They are playing. They're really skilled, a lot of NHL, but they're also just like peaking at the right time. So that's a nasty semifinal, Boston College and Michigan. Uh, three of the four seeds are number one seeds. Michigan's not a one seed. They beat Michigan State. And then over on the other side, you got Denver's real razzle-dazzle. Um, they got a, a guy coming back, I think, from injury, maybe named like Rizzo Mancini or something. <laughs> like, like I, I, he needs to come back because I don't know what's happening with this guy, but one of their top scorers. And then BU has the Celebrini kid, and he's just like, even when he's not really doing – he's like a Crosby, right, where you're kind of like, does he – is he even good? Like three points. I mean, he's he is seventeen years old. He is, and he's a man child, and uh, mm. loves loves the toe drag so, through, his, through his own legs. So what I find amazing is that the the teams and the players that are good this year in college hockey are young. Like the the scoring leaders are freshmen. They're all young. So it's a new thing now. Last like five to seven years, starting with Eichel probably. To go back to the rat, uh, he, he led the scoring for BU as a freshman. It's like a new thing now. They're bringing these blue chippers and Fantilli. It's amazing. Yeah, no kidding. Like Will Smith, freshman. I think uh, Celebrini, freshman. And yep. there's a there's like three of the top five point getters in college hockey are freshmen and legitimate freshmen. Blue chippers. They're they're not they're not like two years junior no. freshmen. No, they they're are legit. They are kids 17 so, years old. He, he probably oh, had to accelerate through high school to be a freshman. Unbelievable. First rounders. I mean, just, I mean, he'll be first overall, Celebrini. Um, no, it's great. I wanted to ask you this. I, I, so, everyone says the Stanley Cup's the hardest trophy to win of all. I got to say, Matt, it is so damn hard to win a college national championship now. Like, this one and done, like, I think it's, I mean, you look at Minnesota, five titles ever. Not a lot. They're, if you're supposed to be the Alabama of hockey, not even close. Now, Denver has nine, but Michigan Boston College nine. Boston College only five, right? Yeah. So a lot of these powerhouses, North Dakota's maybe six or something, they just – it is it is so hard. I'm watching uh, even Minnesota. They had a pretty good performance from some of their fifth-year seniors. They Maybe we're going to get to St. Paul. I don't know if they could have won it, but – God, it is hard to win a national championship in hockey, too. I, I feel mean, for all the different bar the and restaurants in and St. Paul, though. To your point, if you're a pure college hockey fan, these are four unbelievable teams that are coming to St. Paul. But if you own a bar or restaurant, a hotel in this town, terrible. You got no Minnesota teams. You don't have North Dakota. Two Boston. Travels. Yeah, it's it was a big hit for for the, all the folks here locally. I still think Minnesota, being the state of hockey, you're going to have fans that come down here. And it's going to be terrific hockey. You're likely going to see the kid that gets picked first in the NHL draft later this summer. So there are a lot of reasons to want to be down here. But with no Minnesota, no UMD, no North Dakota, no Minnesota State, sorry, Dan Myers, it's not going to be the same uh, without one local team here to play on, on local soil. So that's a bummer. Yeah, and you're probably, I mean, you might see B. 
Everybody hates Michigan from Minnesota these days. Um, the so other U of M. I know they're going to yeah. probably win it though, right? I mean, they. Uh, I I don't know. I think I think you end up seeing BC, maybe BU final. Wow, like it's a bean pot, a bean pot special. I don't know. Nice. B- BC is pretty good. Uh, they even they as are. young as they are, they and they they're so good that they can do stupid things and still win. They like that Will football? Smith, yeah, had just like a. He'll just get pissed and cross-check someone and take a penalty. They'll give up a goal, but they are so talented yeah. that they can get out of it. Yeah, so that was that was something. I, I wanted to ask you golf. So you're, you're a fiend on the golf and the gambling and stuff. Um, first of all, will Tiger Woods ever win another major? I'm just going to throw that out there. And then – uh, No, impossible. Not impossible. If it's yeah, going to happen, it's, it's going to be Augusta. But there's a I big, still love betting on him in every I, major. I love the guy. Uh, everybody's just gotten too good. Like – Scotty Scheffler this year looks like Tiger Woods from the early 2000s. But Not yesterday. As you look at it, he ran second. So he's played 36 rounds of golf this season on the PGA Tour. He's had one round where he shot even par. The other 35, he shot under par. I mean, nobody better tee to green. He's the overwhelming favorite here in 10 days at Augusta at 4-1. to one. I haven't seen odds lower than 10-1 to one to win a major since Tiger in the early 2000s. And the problem for Tiger is going to be physically he just he's not going to hold up for four days. Like Augusta's the one place where he has all the history, the course knowledge, the confidence to do it. I've been there. I've walked that golf course. You've been there. It's hilly. It's undulated. It is hard physically at his age to get around, and he's just not going to be able to do it for four days. And the golfers of this generation are so much better than the golfers he faced when he won a bulk of his majors. And he's the reason for that. The guys that are all there right now were yeah. all inspired by Tiger Woods in the early 2000s. Justin Thomas, Jordan Spieth, Rory McIlroy. Tiger Woods was their idol, was their mentor. He brought physical fitness into golf. Look at these guys. I watched it yesterday. Steven Yeager's a guy most golf fans haven't heard of. Look at him out there, ripping the ball 340 yards down the middle of the fairway. They just took a golf course that they played in Houston that's nearly 7,500 yards and a par 71, and nothing can stop these guys. I think they made a par 70 even. Yeah, and they still shot 12 under. And so When it comes to Tiger, though, I'm going to be devil's advocate here. Go ahead. Because he's shown – part of the reason we love this guy is because he's shown it doesn't matter what obstacle he faced. He was able to overcome it, and he's played through pain before. I think, and I'm a I'm a He's nerd. Not done. He's I'm done. a nerd of the mental side of sport. I don't think he has a reason to win anymore. I don't think he's chasing down the most majors ever. He might get one more, and that's a token win, right? Or call it whatever you want. It's still very meaningful. But he won't be the greatest. He won't win the most of all time. And now it's like, okay, so I just don't think like mentally he has the edge that he had back in the day. So when he when he's uh, Saturday, it's moving day, and he's got to be good. He might actually have an excuse in the brain now that says your leg hurts, you're tired, you're this. We're in the in the way, past. Or, he's Tiger Woods, man. In the past, no way. way. No in the way. past, in the past, no he was able to just plow. I'm scared right that you even said that. Like Tiger's going to be like standing by he your. He thinks car. he's the best. He knows it matters, and he thinks he's going to win again. My point is, the players that he's going to have to beat to do it are so much better than even five years ago when he did do yeah. it. I think my point is, I don't think that his game has dropped off because of like the, the physicality or like you his think inability. It's the ears, huh? Yeah, I think it's I think it's desire. It's different things, and when you lose that, you lose physical ability. Tiger's a head case. Jack Eichel's a rat. Hmm. This is good for clicks, by the way. <laughs> um, hey, so he just needs two more though, and he's the most all time, right? So I mean, it's there. Yeah, Nicholas. I mean, it, it, I. Still so what think- is that? What is the total at? He's got fourteen. And what's Nicholas have? 16. 16. So he so needs he, three I mean, more. It's right there. He needs three more. Well, two but more if he tie. ties it, it two would to tie. be. Tie, you're still the greatest. No one's going to argue. Um, so is Scheffler going to – Scheffler? Scheffler's going to most likely win the Masters. But, again, it's the Masters. Give it's, us some sleepers. Though. Give us some uh, some radar. value because we got two majors coming up this month, right? Or very gonna, let's soon. do a Masters pool for the podcast. Yep. Well, it starts with Hideki Matsuyama, who nobody's talking about because – You're big on him. I, I'm real big on, on course history. He, uh, he was low am in 2011 on this golf course. He won the Masters in 2021. Last couple of years, he's had back and neck issues, hasn't been healthy. 
he's healthy this year. And he won uh, six weeks ago at Riviera, which is a super demanding golf course, a lot like Augusta with a lot of undulation. He was unbelievable. I mean, that was the weekend where Scheffler, uh, I'm sorry, Shoffle and Cantley had the big lead, and Matsuyama shot the Sunday 64 and went right on by. He's in great form. He is certainly one to watch. And then a guy nobody's talking about, Sahithi Gala. If you've watched golf this year, he, he popped up in the Waste Management Open in Phoenix and, and really had a great weekend, had the lead through 54 holes. Young, great personality, family travels with him wherever he goes, tight-knit family. Sahithi Gala from Pepperdine, another guy like 50 or 60 to 1. You're going to get 30 to 1 on Matsuyama. You're going to get 50 to 60 to 1 on Sahithi Gala. Those are the two sleepers I'm kind of focused on as I've gotten ready for Augusta. But, I mean, Scheffler, you've got Rom, Kepka coming from the live guys are coming. They were so good last year in this event, kind of proving a point. It's going to be so good, though. We're going to be in Vegas with the Wild for the Masters. Oh, can't wait. That's tasty. I like a little Max Homa, too, a little fish tacos. Get some kind of – So likable. He just – it makes me, like, flat brim, just kind of <laughs> – He's into the He's weekend. your kind of guy for sure. Oh, yeah. He, he's a he's he's social media guy. He's yeah, got he's a fun. great sense of humor. You guys would be good buddies. He's, he's a good one. I, I love it, man. I The music and the get the gin and tonics out for the first <laughs> time all year. The twinkle toe of the piano. Yeah, I, I can't There's something wait. special about the Masters. If, you're, if you live in Minnesota like we do and you can make it to the week of the Masters, it's like – a rite of spring, right? We, we've survived, and this winter is a bad example because it really didn't happen. But, like, if you're in Minnesota and, like, golf courses are opening, the Masters is on. You mentioned the music, Jim Nance, Butler Cabin. Like, it's sports Americana at its very best. And everybody, like, we're taking an Uber from San Jose. We're going to go to San Francisco. We're going to stay in the hotel for like three or four hours at the airport and take like a 5.45 a.m. flight to get home, our whole TV crew, so we can watch the Masters on that Sunday. The team is going on to a game that's nationally televised. We're all on our own, and we can't wait just to get home in time to hear Jim Nance say, welcome, friends. It's Sunday at the Masters. Magnolia Lane. Oh. <laughs> Can't yeah, it's, it's emotional. I, oh, I, I love it so much. Uh, I just got to put this on record. I'm going Tony Finau and Fitzpatrick as my two. Uh, oh, I like it. Yeah. He's got braces, right? Yeah, sunscreen galore. Doesn't rub it all in, so we'll have, you know, <laughs> <laughs> you know what I'm talking about? Yeah, now Tony Finau loves Augusta, plays well there, has so much trouble finishing the deal. He is... So much that pretty girl that flirts with you all year long, and it comes time where you're going to get the curse ask her to prom. Her prom. <laughs> okay, yeah. She's going with her yeah, girlfriends with and doesn't want to hang out with you at prom. Like, it's so enticing. Tony Finau hits these bombs off the tee, and he's got this unbelievable short game. And the putter gets out there, and you're like, oh, no, he looks like he looks like LaPanta on the green. Like, the way he putts, it's like this can't match the rest of his game, right? But he's such a likable guy. Family guy. He's got like eight kids. He's wholesome. He's lovable. And then you mentioned Fitzpatrick. I mean, we got to know him a little bit during that uh, full swing series on Netflix. Again, family kid. Uh, hits it straight as a string. Nerdy thing. Has a notebook that writes down every single shot he takes in a tournament. He notebooks every shot. He gets off the, off the golf course and literally writes down all shots from his entire round. So he took 69 shots, and there's details about each shot. What nice went round. well, what didn't go well. Thank you. And uh, good teamwork there. Bottom line is two good picks, under the radar, good prices, can win if Scheffler has a bad weekend. If Scheffler plays his game, it's over. Are you a good golfer? Used to be. I what, think. What's your uh, handicap? I'd be a bogey golfer now, shoot probably around 90. I used to play a lot. I, I mentioned I, I worked every summer at the golf course. At my peak was probably a seven or eight handicap. Didn't stay with it. Started working at Canterbury in 2000, and that was kind of like what you did every weekend. You went to the track, and I worked. And I loved it. I'm not complaining, but I didn't play golf. And the game slowly got worse. I'm good to having a scramble for one reason. I can still putt. Like, I caddied for all those years. I can read a green. I can putt the rest of my game. Bill's looking for a caddy. Thanks. I loved a caddy. I still love to loop a bag. So you uh... – Let's say you get two tickets to the Masters 
or to the Derby? Where are you going? Masters, and it's not close. And I, again, I love the Derby. I've been to five. They're incredible. Oh, you've been to five Derbies? Five Kentucky Derbies. Oh, and it's why. it's a party. It's that. cool. It's awesome. I went when I was a lot younger. You can wear a hat. You can wear a really cool hat, fedora, the suit, the whole thing. But the Masters, I've been to one. It was a long time ago, back in 2008. And all my life, I watched it on TV and said, there's no way it looks that nice when you get there. And you arrive there, and you're like, oh, my God, it's even better. It's heaven. Like, I went on a Wednesday for the for the par three in the practice round. I went on a Thursday for opening round. It was, without a doubt, the best sporting event I've ever attended. I've been to Stanley Cups. I've been to Final Fours. I've been to Kentucky Derby's Belmont Stakes. I've been to the World Series. Um, nothing compares to Augusta. All right, you gotta you gotta go see the tax man, but we, I think we gotta land this plane because we teased everybody at the beginning. What's with the cabbage patch doll at the state tournament? Oh, good lord! Yeah, so, so and also the neck roll. Are you? <laughs> did you get hurt in a car accident before the state tournament? No, because you're wearing like a actual neck brace. He's it's a linebacker. A he loved so, he loved Kevin Spielman or whatever that guy's name was from the Lions. So well, anyone that hasn't watched this, go on YouTube. Uh, I think it's called Vintage Hockey or something. 1985 state tournament. Gorg wins at four to three. They interview him afterwards. He's he's wearing a full neck brace, and someone walks up during your interview. And One of the hands cheerleaders you, hand me a cabbage patch doll, so which why? were iconic at the time. I don't know why she did, and I'm always <laughs> talking with my hands, so you know. I get this cabbage patch and you patch just doll, grab it, and I'm talking, and it looks like yeah, it doesn't look good. And the neck brace, you had two choices back in the mid '80s for goalies. You had to wear the thing I wore or that big plastic. Shield that would hang down. And oh, yeah. And I hated it because I like to, you know, I was always looking around and I don't know. I, I went with the, it looks like a bad turtleneck. But uh, between that and the cabbage patch doll, the guy that's interviewing me and another guy that, rest in peace, a dear friend of all of ours at Bally Sports North, Tom Hanneman, was the guy that, that interviewed me on the ice. And I was such a nerd and I was talking so fast and I was so excited that he was chuckling like laughing, watching me with this Cabbage Patch doll make a complete ass of myself. Um, but I, I wouldn't trade it in for the world. you still have the Cabbage Patch doll? I don't. I, I don't even know where Give the damn thing the is. Girls. But I, I will tell you that, that um, for a guy that grew up, like, dreaming about only that as a kid, like from mm-hmm. age like five or six on, to live it out, um, I made an ass of myself. It's a horrific interview. But – the time there that night was all worth it, so I'm okay with it. Who do you think is going to follow Lou and Annie on the state tournament? Good luck to whoever does. <laughs> I mean, you can't – no, I mean, no no question you can't fill that void. I mean, Lou and Annie is that broadcast, is that state tournament. So whoever it is, I wish them luck. There's some great candidates out there. I mean, Mark Parrish has done an awesome job for years in that spot. You know, Ben Clymer's terrific at his craft. Pat Micheletti will probably throw his name in, in the hat. They're all good, and they're all going to be just fine, but they're not going to be Lou. Like, yeah. for all of us, this year was so bittersweet because it was such a great celebration of a guy. Who's going to Brett Favre it? He's going to Brett Favre it. I don't think he's he He's going to come back for I the title game. No, he's not. <laughs> I, I have had this conversation with Louie. I am 100% sure this is it. But, man, to go out was still – able to throw your fastball and, and to get out. Like, he's still got yeah, it. Lou's a negotiator. He's a negotiator. Oh, yeah, so he is, an, now, <laughs> he is a negotiator. Anyone that doesn't think he's going to be involved with the successor is out of their mind, too. I would agree with and that, the too. And the, only name, like not, the only name he said when he was here oh God. was Gorgie. That's who Nanny wants, I think. Well, bottom line I really line do. This. I think that if, if Lou could pick someone, I think he would pick you. Louie has been – a great friend and a great mentor for many, many years. And it's funny because we grew up, we didn't like Lou Nanny. We were in Burnsville. Edina was our rival. His kid, Marty, was one of their best players. And so we cringed at the idea in the mid-'80s that Lou Nanny was calling the game. I am so happy now, looking back almost 40 years later, that I can go back and watch those games. And Chris Cuthbert, you know, again, an iconic voice from Hockey Night in Canada, still to this day north of the border, is play-by-play, play and Lou Nanny's doing color. It makes it that much more important and special, and it's funny how your your lens changes over the years. Lou did say that he's unbiased until there's a family member in the game, then he is biased. So those games that you played at Dinah when he was doing Oh, he was for sure turned <laughs> against us. 100%. God, did we miss anything? I think we got it all. Yeah, we got Covered it. Covered a lot of ground today. We did. I, I will say just the, the if we don't make the playoffs – 
I think I'm I'm so tired of losing. I think I'm going big into Timberwolves and PWHL. No. I, I don't care. I just need a win somewhere. I'd love to see the Wolves get paid. I'd love to see it happen. Uh, the P-Dub team's got a real shot, and, and that's that's going to be really cool. But the Wolves thing's legit, and I have a lot of friends that are longtime yeah. NBA guys. I'm not. I'm not going to sit here and claim I'm some big NBA guy. I'm not. But I'd be really happy for them. When I show up as a fan, like it's going to be that. so awkward. Don't you dare. It's like you come into a chat room. That's been like established for like 15 years, and you're like, "Hey, yeah, that's what I'm nervous about." So, <laughs> hey, um, so, so this I'm new here, who, who's the guy that's like Michael Jordan? Yeah, somebody said that to Ant? me. Ant, okay, yeah, what's his number? Yeah, that's he's my favorite. So that's what somebody said to me. Ant's like Jordan, and I laughed at him, and no, I was like, "This is a joke." I've, been, I've heard that too. It <laughs> isn't. I, by the way, that's what they tell like people are non-basketball saying. fans. By the way, they're like, "Well." There is someone like Michael Jordan, and you're like, huh? No. I mean, that that no. I heard the same thing, man. Don't go there. I, I've heard it multiple times. But don't go there. You can't say He's not Michael Jordan. <laughs> Please stop. He's a hell of a player. But he might be, and I would have no idea. He's not, <laughs> and we're all going to move on because there are no Michael Jordans on that team. There are no Michael Jordans in that league. Yeah, speaking no disrespect of, to LeBron James, well, but Carter he's, just said Tigers, you know, he's fresh. I just, I, I, I just. Mean, wait, it's, all bets are off now. Come on. Do, remind me on the next podcast. I'll go deeper into that. Why, like, I think, like, he... Um, Tiger's the last thing. He, the last no thing he way. is is fragile. The reason he's not I'm the greatest actually is concerned. Like, this is like when Duhame... He desire to be the greatest. No, when Duhame was with heckling ability. Flower, Tiger knows you just said that. That's fine. He's... he's Terrible he's, take. He's Art. standing... You've had so many good takes in the last... He's standing next to your car minutes. right That's now. Terrible take. Okay, Tiger Woods well, is not wired to not think that Tiger Woods is the best golfer on the planet... Then and now. Like, he's just not wired any other way. He, I, I think you're right. But that's where I think that, like, he actually thinks now that maybe he's no, not, he like. No, he doesn't. Like, there, there's the a crack he in his himself. armor and water's making its way through it. No like, chance. Yeah, no, I, no, think. No, no. I think. If he gets beat, it's not going to be anything between the ears. He physically is starting to break down. The torque that he put on his body. To call it what you want. All the, right, I'm going to go physical. The you physicality is 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 an excuse. It's no. hard for guys that are good to be able to it's admit that they are not surgeries good. carts. It, it isn't an excuse. Then don't play. If you can't win, don't he can't play. can't help himself. Don't play if you can't he win. can't help himself. He rolled his car, like, down a hill, like a naked gun movie. Yeah. Yeah. Painkillers. And, <laughs> yes. We, we, we shouldn't go down that road, but why? Why are you driving that fast? Why are you in that He's spot Tiger at that time? Woods, man. Yeah. He doesn't okay. have any rules. Right. He didn't want it. He believes that he can still win. <laughs> I know that. Uh, I love it. <sighs> Hey, hey well, but speaking of Michael Jordan and uh, Tiger Woods, I hope you have their size tax return. Get to that tax man before you're late. Got to go right now. All right. We're here. Till it's here. Peace.